Are you an early stage founder revolutionizing the future of retail? Then you're in the right place. My name is Sapna Shah, and I'm an angel investor investing at the pre-seed and seed stage in retail tech, e-commerce, marketplaces, and consumer. I'm also the founder of RetailX Series, an ecosystem to help early stage founders in the retail and consumer sectors. RetailX Series includes events, a YouTube channel, a Slack community, resources for founders, and this podcast. In this podcast, I interview founders, investors, and experts in the retail space, and we dig deep into the tactics around key topics that early stage founders want to hear about. Welcome to the RetailX Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Retail X Series podcast. I'm your host, Sapna Shah. Today's episode tackles the topic of fundraising for DTC brands, especially in the current environment. Our guest today, Sarah Foley, is partner at SWAT Equity with a deep background in consumer. Sarah will walk us through her best advice for fundraising at the early stages for consumer brands. Welcome to the podcast, Sarah. Thanks. I'm so glad to do this and chat with you. It's going to be fun. It's going to be great. So let's start with a little bit of background. Can you tell us a little bit about you and your background before we get into SWOT equity? Sure. So my entire career has largely been in finance, investing in companies. It ranges the gamut from angel stage all the way through mature and leveraged buyout stage as part of my private equity background. So I've seen all sorts of development phases. I've seen all sorts of cycles in the economy and how companies have managed to navigate through them. I have to say, I like this earlier stage of the capital stack because it's more collaborative and you're investing because companies continue to grow rather than right size and shrink. And that's just a lot more enjoyable. So my background is largely finance and investing in companies, supporting managers, supporting the founders. But I did have a brief stint where I was an operator in a cookie company here in New York City for about two and a half years, had a great time and just further, I would say, reinvigorated my passion for the consumer category. The cookie story is actually my favorite part about you, about your background. It's so great. (laughs) It's funny because so many people bring that up first. They lose track of the 18 years I've been investing and they look (laughs) at the kind of two year period where I was at the cookie company, but it was a lot of fun. Okay, so let's move to your investing activity. So tell us a little bit more about SWAT equity and kind of your investment focus sweet spot, your check size, like whether you lead, a little bit of background for the audience. Sure. We are a consumer brand focused firm and our capital is invested in early stages of growth and scaling. Typically that looks like seed and series A stages of the venture capital rounds. We look at all types of product categories. We look at consumer services, services, restaurant would be in that category. That kind of has a unit box where you're selling from is definitely well within that category. And then the other area that we'd like to spend the time around is figuring out what tech solutions are out there that our brands would benefit from to continue their scaling efforts efficiently and productively. That could mean commerce technology, e-commerce types of technologies, retention, loyalty oriented, but also think about, call it back of the house. So what's going on in the tools that you can use to help manage supply chain and kind of everything that that implies a bit better too. We keep it a bit vaguer on purpose in order to just attract lots of different types of opportunities, often from within the portfolio. What are they using? Where are their pain points that a particular solution either exists or may or should exist that we'd like to look at? But across all sorts of product and service categories is where we probably spend 70% of our time. We have invested our first fund. In 26 companies, we have a couple more new investments that we'll make. They have, again, been at that seed and series A stage. Generally, our first check size is about $250,000 to $500,000. We have more often co-invested alongside others, but lately led a couple of rounds as we start positioning ourselves for a fund two raise process that I'm now in the part in, in, that I'm now doing. Let's see. We've had... A couple of exits, which are exciting, in the form of a financial wellness business called Frank, started by a woman named Charlie. That is a great company that JP Morgan acquired last year. We were also an investor in Supergroup, which is a great beauty brand that was expanding the sun care category. 
And most recently, I had an exit an apparel business we invested in called Nix that does women's intimates. All three were actually founded by women. And they are largely products for women, with the exception of Frank. And I think that just speaks to another differentiation point we have, which is 65% of the portfolio is represented by underrepresented founders and or leaders. And then the last thing I think I would add is one of the ways we think about the world, finding opportunity, assessing opportunity, and ultimately picking companies to be in portfolios, applying three different lenses to that process. One is the inevitable venture capital lens and what are the tools of the trade and the kind of things that we need to do as investors to support a founder in an early stage, get them ready for raising the next round and do some other things. A second one is my background in private equity and my other partner, Mark Hauser's background in private equity. And that's applying that disciplined approach around rigor to the process of sourcing, evaluation, and portfolio management. And then the third, equally important, is born kind of out of the experience of our third partner, Richard Kirschenbaum, and that is incredible marketing and branding experience and expertise across both digital and analog kind of channels of communicating their differentiation of a product or a service. But we just find that's really an important part of how a consumer brand in the food category is really articulating why their particular product is better than the others on the shelf. And that's ultimately what's helping them drive revenue and repeat purchase, which is super important, we think, to the process of finding early stage brands that can really become iconic. I love you, that you mentioned that because we could have a whole podcast just about branding <laughs> stuff, but we won't get down, we won't go down that road today, but maybe that's something for the future. Okay. That was a very helpful context. So now thinking about the kind of the founders in the retail X podcast audience, many of whom who are either launching a consumer brand, fundraising for consumer brands at pre-seed and seed usually. And right now we're sitting here in New York in October of 2022, and the environment is, let's call it uncertain for fundraising. <laughs> So let me get your take on, firstly, are you seeing that consumer brands can raise right now? I think there's a lot of discussion in the market of whether brands can raise right now, or are they just completely out of fashion? The answer is definitely yes. I mean, companies are raising capital. The process is certainly taking longer, even for, I think, a good brand that has some traction. Because the investing community, whether it's an angel investor uh, or all the way through to kind of a growth equity investor, are, as you pointed out, more uncertain of the current environment and how long it might last due to larger economic macro and even geopolitical factors. So the slowdown in fundraising timetable, I think, is largely due to that factor. The way I see rounds getting done today is largely bridgy in feeling, buying another 12 months of time, making sure the kind of balance sheet is as short up as we can make it. And they're largely led by the internal investor group. Uh, they're not putting the entire amount of the bridge in, but they're certainly weighing in with a significant minority, if not majority of the round to show support, which is optically pretty important as you're messaging out there to the investor community. Brands that are still growing nicely and have great traction that for various reasons aren't having trouble getting decent terms. I would say they're pretty reasonable, a bit more investor friendly, but they're not down rounds. And at the, I think the other thing I would say is in addition to the deal du jour being more in, in, inside investor led, more often we're seeing valuation on the round that's getting raised is kind of reopening to the more the most recent round that was raised and likely given where we are in 2022 was raised in the peaks of 2021. So for us, that just means, yes, these companies are getting some capital in the door, but they're, they're earning into that large valuation that they may have struck in terms last year. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because I think you, you definitely come from a place of seed series. As I come from a place of pre-seed, it's all over the map at pre-seed because mm -hmm. sometimes you're pre-revenue, pre-product. And if, if you're not talking to VCs and you're kind of doing these party rounds, 
<laughs> valuation is going to be all over the place yeah. and round size is yeah. going to be all over the place. But the question I wanted to ask you about seed rounds in particular, and this was actually a question I just got from a founder, which was, is it reasonable as a consumer brand to go out right now and say, I want to raise like a $7 million seed with, let's call it a little bit less than a million? No. <laughs> That's the short answer. I, I mean, <laughs> I think it's, look, nothing is, I think, ever impossible if you have a very well-respected multi-company founder who's just got an excellent track record raising a $7 million seed round for something that's got really, really early traction. It's going to be a lot of lift, but possible for them. Uh, but I feel that's the category of exception. I just think the environment is cooled to a point where, you know, $7 million, where are you going to spend the $7 million? If you're launching it purely on an e-commerce channel, I would be pretty worried about how much of that seven is going to be spent on customer acquisition with the efficiency that we're seeing out there, which is not that efficient right now. If it was a company launching a fairly large product portfolio, portfolio into a brick and mortar retailer of substantial size, call it a thousand or 2000 doors. That makes a bit, a little bit more sense in how I kind of bridge the $7 million need, but, but still a big risk to take on that many doors with that kind of inventory need, the working capital challenge that could represent. So I would say don't go raise seven unless you are a very well-respected multi kind of exit founder. Do more with less and figure out how you're going to bridge that, that gap. Yeah, and that's a great segue into kind of this omni-channel kind of strategy. So one of the big questions that's come from the group, the Retail X Slack group, has been about being omni-channel if you're a D2C brand. I would have said a few years ago, a lot of investors were scared of fiscal retail and wholesale accounts and getting into all the targets and all of that. But with, to your point, customer acquisition costs online just rising like crazy and the return just not there. I think a lot of GDC founders are looking at Omnichannel right from the beginning. What's your take on that? What's your take on kind of both the wholesale side as well as like maybe pop-ups and doing your own stores mm -hmm. as a brand? Mm -hmm. Huge thumbs up. Now, ultimately, the, the kind of investments that or the brands in which we invest, we always go into it with an expectation that multi-channel is part of the strategy. But if we're investing in a company at the seed stage and they've only launched in a channel to get going, which is generally going to be your e-commerce channel, we understand that, but we have to believe that the founders have a broader vision for how they ultimately want their distribution to work. And remember, 80% of our purchases are still being made in a store. And that facing on a shelf serves two purposes. One is obviously revenue, but it's also marketing and brand awareness that doesn't have CAC associated with it. It's a different, it's a different investment. There's cost to it, but you're likely to get more people seeing your product. Now you have to perform in that brick and mortar door with strong velocity or expected, if not exceeding velocity expectations from the retailer. But we want Omni. I think it's healthy. You just have to be smart and prudent about the costs associated with launching that other channel. The other thing we I feel like in the last three years, not even five, the there's another new channel out there that our brands are definitely embracing, and that's the Amazon channel. It literally can stand on its own. As it's another e-tailer account, if you will, but it's so massive that you have to consider it at this point and not view it as a conflict channel to your own direct e-commerce channel. It's being used for so much discovery, as you well know. And if you learn, if you haven't gone into the Amazon kind of distribution <laughs> network yet, you can learn a lot before you start in terms of how popular the products are that you're selling in terms of search volume and even your own brand recognition in some of that search to give you an indication of, could you be successful? We're also finding that particular channel, when you look at the contribution margin of profit associated with Amazon versus your own e-com is oftentimes better, which is something to note and to be, you know, really carefully vetting and investigating as you start to launch and you grow and you dedicate some dollars to marketing on Amazon. 
Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I think the I think there has been a tendency for founders to think that they shouldn't be on Amazon because that is something that investors don't want to see. That is that's bad for their brand. Yeah, I thought I would have said that three years ago go as short as three years ago it would have been a question mark or a really why now it's almost a it's an early it's an early channel to embrace in my opinion because at the moment and this is you know can always change but at the moment i think you can be profitable more quickly on amazon again from contribution margin point of view than in brick and mortar i have a whole nother philosophy around the brick and mortar channel that I think some early stage brands also need to be thinking through. And we've chatted about that too, but I very much, we support Omni. We don't have to have you in Omni in order to start to make our initial investment, but the vision has to be there for how are you going to continue to grow, you know, that early adopter, small group of consumers into larger concentric circles of more and more and more broad adoption. And you have to do that through embracing other channels. And does that, does your thought process as an investor change on when some of those concentric circles of distribution have to happen based on the category, meaning like fashion versus beauty versus food versus beverage? Do you look at the categories differently? It's a great question. And I think the answer is probably yes. And it's probably a completely geeky answer, but the answer probably lies within dim weight. And that means dimensional weight associated with how much it costs to ship that package of product from your e-commerce, your kind of fulfillment side. And the heavier the product, so think ready to drink beverages versus a piece of apparel, which is going to ship in a largely flattish, smaller package is just going to be much more economical than sending out a case of ready to drink beverages or ready to drink spirit or whatever it may be all of that incremental weight is very expensive and only going up in price. So we've had great success in our portfolio with apparel companies really doing well in their e-commerce channel, their own e-commerce channel. And in most cases, their wholesale is either non-existent or small. So they're not necessarily selling to another retailer, a department store or somebody else in specialty kind of apparel they're actually opening up their own retail doors, kind of to your point of what other kind of ways of expanding channel distribution. It's brick and mortar, but it's their owned, own owned branded brick and mortar. So that's been an interesting, a big theme in our apparel companies like a Nix or a Nada or Hatch, our maternity brand. Whereas food is doing better in brick and mortar and they start focusing on all right, I'm in grocery, but do I go more natural, non-conventional grocery? Then do I go club channel? And then do I take on something else? Beauty is a little bit of a hybrid because it can do, they're smaller type of packages. They don't weigh, their products aren't that big. So you can successfully execute against a great e-commerce strategy. But still, 80% of people are in a beauty retailer type of door experimenting and trying a product before they buy, which is important too. And they're pursuing both e-commerce, Amazon, and their own kind of specialty retailer, Think Ulta and, and Sephora, obviously, as the two big ones in that channel. That's really helpful. I think that everything that you just said is probably what founders have been thinking, but thinking, okay, I need to change my pitch when I'm fundraising because people investors won't want to hear those things, right? And I think that it is very helpful to, to hear it from an investor that, yes, this is exactly how you should be thinking about your business. I think it, it has to be. Now, I appreciate that it precede and seed, it's still early and you're still getting traction in a particular channel. You can't take limited dollars and more importantly, your limited precious time resources and attack five channels that is not advisable. You need to demonstrate traction because you do have, you believe you have a differentiated product for whatever reason. So get traction going and start focusing on the, the right metrics in that particular channel. And then that should, as customers continue buying more, adopting more, re returning to buy more, 
can open the door for conversations to expand into that next channel, whether it's another e-tailer. And don't forget some of these brick and mortar retailers like Sephora, like Walmart, like Target have .com businesses where you can start with them online before you go take on that larger investment of inventory required to go fill doors. And we've had brands do that, which I think is interesting. What I would say is to your original point when we started, the environment is wonky and we've got some amazing large national retailers that are still recovering from supply chain woes due to the pandemic. So what we've also been chatting a lot with portfolio companies about is you've got to get more innovative around your retail kind of launch strategy. Please don't assume that just because Target has been so friendly to up and coming direct to consumer brands that they will continue to give everyone that support going forward. They're overbranded. They're over inventoried right now as they work through their system. Don't use them as the playbook to get that, that next retailer account to be interested that you think will help you with a fundraise because you need to start financing all of that inventory. I would encourage everybody to think a little bit more creatively and maybe think more regional retailers. We've got a business that has a lot of popularity on college campuses. Should they be talking to college union? Who's doing the distribution into all of those stores on campus? to get product to those students and customers versus, all right, do I have to go to CVS instead? The bigger the brand, the bigger the retailer, the kind of more problems and challenges they may be experiencing at the moment. Um, and you've got to get creative because you've got to keep, you have to keep moving and you can't stand still. But I wouldn't assume that the kind of traditional last three year playbook of how I launch into retail is necessarily going to be productive right now. I love that. That's great advice. So true. And the creativity and thinking outside the box on where are the other boxes that you yes. can yes. sell into is really important. Okay. So we've talked about Omnichannel and that you clearly have thought about a lot about that, which is great. What else kind of thinking about kind of seed stage, what else is the most important to you when you're evaluating early stage consumer brands? Are those sales and traction numbers different now than they were a few years ago? <laughs> what kind of metrics you mentioned, yeah. some of the metrics that you look at, what are the most important things that you are looking at when you're evaluating consumer brands? right now in this environment? Okay. I say to start off with, it's the same as it always has been. And that is what is the differentiation of this new product or service relative to what else the consumer has available to them? What is it and how is that being conveyed to that targeted customer? So let's put an example behind it. We earlier in the year made an investment in a brand called Mad Rabbit. In addition to loving the name, which I just think is fun, it is a technically in the beauty category, and it is skincare products that are tattoo safe formulated for people who have ink. And the reason I think they exist is because some of the formulation tricks and other products that people may use for aftercare and daily care of their skin when they have ink on their skin isn't friendly to that tattoo, meaning it might have, for example, vitamin E in the formulation, which is really great for skin that doesn't have coloring ink in the kind of skin, but it has, because it extracts impurities. And as a result, it's going to start dulling that tattoo over time. Another big way in which tattoos get dulled over time is sun exposure. So what the Mad Rabbit duo and team now that's grown wonderfully from 2019 when they got started is conveying that information to their consumer in terms of the before, before and after, like a classic branding and marketing move of what your tattoo looks like just before you use their soothing gel or their balm and after. And it's been very effective. So that is the, the tenant and really the core pillar of everything that we look at is put it through that lens of what does differentiation look like and how's it getting conveyed after that then we start looking at more kind of quantitative things metrics if, as you mentioned that i think they differ a little bit by category but they also have kind of channel differentiation too. unit economics obviously you want to see a kind of minimum margin even though it's an early stage business and your kind of volumes that you're 
producing or having manufactured aren't high yet, you still have to have unit economics that actually work and are going to be profitable. We then look at an account in kind of Amazon world. We look at whether that those economics make sense. We'll look at channel economics. How do you get into wholesale? And then how do you get into the accounts in, in wholesale and make the right decisions? Because each of those accounts has different margin profiles and they have different levels of support they'll give you and they require different investment from you to keep the product on the shelf. So you've got to go do a lot of spade work to make sure you understand what are the margin profiles that big box or big volume movers are going to use. And it's not 50% all of the time. It's lower than that, meaning the brand is going to have a lower margin, but we'll push more volume potentially. We'll look at efficiency rates. One big one is marketing efficiency. What are you spending overall and how much revenue are you generating? We'll certainly look at return on ad spend, especially in kind of paid channels, obviously. We'll look at what we call capital efficiency, which is how much cumulative revenue has this company generated relative to rounds of capital raised, making sure we're giving credit where it's due on we raised this round last year, therefore... Yeah, we'll look at this current year as a revenue contrib contribution to that, that metric, but it's very telling and it's been a kind of key indicator lately on do we think this team is managing cash and agency service, whatever, lots of different ways in which those expenses can go. We look at employee count and we look at revenue to employee too. More telling as the business gets a bit bigger in the series A round, but we're not opposed to making these investments ahead of growth, but you've got to always be careful and it's your runway needs to be long enough to demonstrate additional milestones and tractions to be positioned perfect, positioned well for that next capital round. And then lately we've, I wouldn't say we've relaxed, we've, we've recalibrated <laughs> <laughs> our expectations on year over year growth. So it's a big one. A lot of founders ask me, I'm sure they do for you as well as, especially at this pre-seed low, post-revenue launch, should we be growing 100% year over year, 300% first, and then, 400, and then 250, and then 100, and then 50? And the answer is it's all over the map now. And I would prefer that your revenue growth decrease to 30 percent 25 percent for a year in which we will likely have next year with more of an economic slowdown in place so that you're not spending furiously against a 50 to 100 percent growth rate and run out of cash too soon meaning you've got to go back to market sooner than you expected to raise that next round i'd rather you slow the roll as they say a little bit and extend the runway in that direction. Okay, that was very interesting and very helpful. So, you know what, one of the things that I'm sure you've seen this as well, but I'm starting to see it at Precede is founders who've bootstrapped or raised a little bit of friends and family money, were growing like crazy. The growth has slowed mostly because of their ROAS is not as good or whatever channel they were using has slowed. And all of a sudden the growth doesn't look as good and they have to raise and they have to raise right now, mm. which is sort of the position you really don't want to want be to in. Be. Yeah. And certainly not at pre-seed, but even more so at seed. So if I'm a founder right now at pre-seed and I'm not at the, in that situation yet, I'm probably looking ahead to what you just said for seed and saying, okay, I need to work backwards so that I get to that point where I haven't run out of cash when I'm about to raise my seed round. Totally agree. And of course, you and I sitting here talking about it is a hell of a lot easier than our incredible founders who are executing against it with not knowing what they don't have a crystal ball. No one, obviously none of us do. So I don't mean to suggest at all that this is, there's a simple roadmap and playbook for how to make these difficult decisions because they are difficult and you're supposed to be investing in growth ahead of profitability for a period of time here, particularly at the seed and series A stage. But I think in right now, 
with the economic uncertainty, which is a kind way of saying we're going to be slowing further down and next year is going to be interesting. You've got to get ahead of the game because it doesn't, you've got to get ahead of the game on understanding your expense profile, where you can be even further scrappy, where you can allow yourself to slow down growth a bit without cutting, as we say, into muscle in order to keep the fundamentals of your kind of business model alive and well. But my general kind of message to the portfolio has been, I don't need you to grow that 50 to 100. How about we try 25 to above 50 and ease up on paid spend, really examine how efficient your spend has been, put, if you can, the effort into however you can build more organically driven traffic, which by no means is easy, is easy either, but it's, you, you're going to have to continue to think creatively around runway and lower demand period next year, which is what we're, we believe the kind of consumer is going to be doing. Yeah. Could not agree more. I have one last question for you before we wrap this up, which is, are you seeing more brands? And it's, this is very hard to do at pre-seed. So I think it happens a little bit more at seed and series A. Are you seeing more of these early stage brands look for things that are more alternative financing? So whether that's debt, inventory financing, receivables, financing, working capital lines from like yeah. their bank. Yeah. Yes, is the answer, which is good. It's generally in the form of non-recourse debt. It's different types of credit cards that can be used to purchase some portions of the components of building inventory that have some terms to it, if you will, if it's not straight up working capital line of credit or a factoring account of some nature. But what's been happening, I think, for the direct-to-consumer largely oriented brands right now is more financing options have arisen for that type of revenue stream, meaning it's not a Walmart or a Target purchase order that you can go finance, which has been done historically for decades. That only comes when you obviously are in Target or Walmart and those POs start getting larger and larger. There are now companies and I would say financing options for in direct to consumer. So they're figured out ways to underwrite purchasing behavior and get comfortable with extending some incremental credit. It's not going to be massive amounts, but sometimes even a hundred, two hundred, five hundred thousand dollars can buy a lot more time. So you can push that your otherwise equity kind of raised capital into better returning resources, advertising spend, people, and other things. Yeah. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because I think historically, I think early, earlier stage VCs who are looking, VCs and angels who are looking at the earlier stage were like, why do you have all this debt? But mm -hmm. these kinds of businesses, I think, can really use the debt in very clever ways and therefore do not need to raise as much equity in the every single round. Yeah. Which is, as we all know, highly dilutive. So yeah. I'm grateful that there have been this emergence of options that people have developed, largely driven probably by data they've been able to collect and scrape around how some of these other direct-to-consumer sites, if you will, are performing and can start extending some credit that, that way, which is good. Now, the flip side is don't overextend yourself and just take what that lender may be willing to give because it's available. You're still running a business and you're still a fiduciary for your kind of shareholders capital. So you've got to strike the right balance, but learning about those opportunities, I think is important and keeping an eye on when they're going to be best utilized for your company. Yeah, for sure. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing your advice and your tips on the podcast. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. I hope some of it was helpful. Just a note to founders, don't give up. This is another point in time where you get to show your resiliency, your creativity, and ways in which you can innovate too. And that's where we get excited. People aren't going to stop consuming by any stretch, right? They're just going to maybe change some of their habits a little bit. And I think that's also going to be temporary. But we want to see you here and we want to see you tomorrow. So do the right things by gathering a good kind of group of people around you that can help you make strong decisions and keep at it. Amazing advice. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sapna. Always great to see you. And thank you all for listening to the Retail X podcast. We'll have another new episode out shortly. 
Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Retail X Series, check out www.retailxseries.com for more information, including recordings of past events. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Retail X Series. You can also learn more about me, find fundraising resources, or submit a pitch deck at www.redgiraffeadvisors.com. Thanks and catch you next time.